All right, let's get started. Wouldn't it be great if we knew how our customers thought? If we knew what motivated them to make a purchase or how much they would spend? Wouldn't it be great if we knew exactly what our audience was looking for when they came to our website? Well, Carrie and I are here to tell you that you can do all of that. You can ask your customers or even your potential customers and gain all of that information. And you can do it with surveys. Now, most of us get surveys in our inbox all the time and they are terrible. They are long, they are boring. And worse, they don't provide any real data. Most surveys are ineffective at bringing about change, but not the surveys that you're gonna create. Not anymore, because today we're going to give you the skills and share with you the secrets that you need to create effective surveys. Surveys that will provide you with actionable data. The data you need to improve your business and ultimately drive profitability. Let's take a look at the agenda. Congratulations, we're almost through the introduction. Uh, we'll spend the bulk of our time looking at uh, the following, uh, the next three areas. Survey best practices. These are the, the do's and don'ts of how to conduct your survey, how to construct your survey. Uh, then we'll take a look at real world examples. These are actual survey questions that we've conducted over the years for real products, real clients, and we'll talk about how the questions were written and how the answers ultimately influenced the end design. And lastly, we'll take your questions. And we mean this in two ways. Certainly any questions you have about the presentation. Uh, and uh, as Ben mentioned, we'll have a breakout session at, at the end where we can uh, write survey questions together in real time. We'll have some sample scenarios. Uh, you can bring your own as well. Uh, and we'll try to put into practice what we learned today. So one last slide of introduction. These are pictures of me and Carrie. Uh, Carrie and I have been working in user experience research and digital product design for 20 years. We spent our careers building products and digital communities for a variety of industries, uh, including healthcare, education, technology. We formed Sway UX five years ago. Uh, prior to that, our work uh, experience includes some of the biggest names in their respective fields, from GlaxoSmithKline to MTV. And with that, I'll hand it over to Carrie, who's going to kick off best practices. I think you're muted. <clears throat> Thanks, Dan. When we talk about best practices, uh, I think probably the first thing to do makes sense is to really talk about uh, what a survey is. Um, just so we're all on the same page, we know we're all talking about the same thing. Uh, so when we're talking about a survey today, we're talking about a questionnaire that's been put together for the express purpose of collecting the, the thoughts and the experiences of a large group of people, um, usually with the goal uh, to help you inform you know, decisions about your products. Sometimes it's just to gauge uh, customer satisfaction. Um, and there's a few things that we love about surveys, but the main thing um, is that you don't have to be there. Uh, this has always been an advantage, but perhaps now more than ever, it's a huge advantage that, you know, you don't have to do these one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews or uh, go out on the street with a, with a microphone and a recorder. Um, you know, you can put together these surveys and send it out to a huge group and you can, uh, you know, categorize that group any way you need to. Um, and perhaps one of the most valuable things you can get out of this is to understand how your audience talks about you, how they talk about your product, how they talk about your company, how they're talking about your website and what the language is that they're using. And today we'll get into a little bit more about how you can do that. Uh, one question that we do get a lot, um, people love to ask, when is the appropriate time to conduct a user survey? Uh, and I always say, um, whenever you want, which is not an answer that people particularly love, but it is accurate. So anytime you need user input, a survey is a great tool to use because it can be put together quickly. Uh, you can get results back relatively quickly. Um, but some sometimes uh, in a project life cycle uh, where we use surveys a lot personally, uh, we always do it at the start of a new project, almost 100% of the time. Um, Anytime we have um, 
service offerings or a feature list for a product and we need to prioritize those things, we'll send a survey out into the field. Um, anytime we're trying to gauge customer satisfaction, we send out a survey uh, and that's probably the most common uh, use case for surveys that you see in your everyday life. And then of course, anytime you're doing sort of a, a branding exercise or you're trying to make decisions about messaging, that's a great opportunity uh, to use a survey. Uh, and then talking about who to survey, um, we really like to break it down into three distinct groups. So your first group is probably the most obvious group and those are your existing users. Um, so these are people who are currently using your product. Maybe they've used your product in the past, but the, the main idea is that they do have familiarity with who you are, either your product, your company, or they've already used your website. Um, and there's a really specific type of information that you're gonna get from existing users. So with existing users, the type of information you can get from them is of course, how they're using your products, uh, what they think of you as a company. Um, you can find out from them what features they think are most important because they have that familiarity. Uh, they're probably the, the only group you wanna survey if you're trying to gauge customer satisfaction because they're the only ones that are gonna have an opinion. Uh, and really figuring out how people describe the value when they're familiar with you. So people are familiar with their product. How would they describe it to someone else? Um, you know, what words are they using to define your value? Uh, and, and you'll see this come up a lot today. The language is extremely important. The second group uh, is a little bit different. This is your general audience. So these are people that don't know who you are. They haven't used your product before. Maybe they're using a competitor's product. They're familiar with, uh, you know, uh, your competitors in general, what that landscape looks like. Um, and we actually really love a general audience because it's a different set of information that you're going to get from these people. So the thing that uh, someone who's not a user is going to offer you is a fresh perspective. So in many ways, this is the purest data that you're going to get. Uh, they don't they haven't already formed an opinion about your product. They haven't used it before. Um, so, you know, putting questions in front of them and asking questions about the market or um, how they understand your value in, in a first impression sense, uh, their, their gut reactions to messaging that you have out there and really where opportunities are in the general landscape. This is the type of information that a general audience non-user is going to give you. And then we have the third group. And the third group is probably the least used, um, but it is necessary sometimes. So we do wanna cover it. And this is your targeted audience, very similar to a general audience. Um, but the thing that makes it distinct is that if you have a really specialized product, sometimes you have to go targeted audience. Now, I wanna preface this by saying, most of the time a general audience is gonna meet your needs. But occasionally you'll have something that's so specialized that a general audience is going to have no idea what you're asking them about. So a good example of this would be uh, we once were working on a website for a client that provided administrative services for class action litigators. Uh, so they were in the class action administration business. Um, a, a regular person on the street is not going to know anything about what that even is. <laughs> Uh, what a class action administrator does. Um, so we specifically had to target the survey to a group of class action lawyers who had been working in the industry for five or more years. And that's an example of a targeted audience. Um, but uh, I will say there are a, little sim a lot of similarities between targeted audience and general audience in the sense that you're still talking about non-users. So you're still getting that pure data. You're still getting the gut reaction. Um, it's still a good place to go if you're trying to just understand how people describe your value and you know uh, their their your first impressions uh, of their response to your messaging, things like that. So it's the same type of information. You're just really zeroing in on the background uh, of those users. Pardon me, Ben, did I see that we had a, a question in, in chat? It might be a good time to, to address that. Uh, absolutely. The question is, will the slides be shared after the presentation? <laughs> uh, 
Carrie, will the slides be shared? Sure. There you go. Also, the, I will clarify that this is being recorded and will be published uh, through ATO. Very good. So let's get into what makes a good survey. And perhaps to do so, we can talk about, well, what makes a bad one? And there are a lot of them out there. When we talk about bad surveys, we talk about survey fatigue. This is where the user who's taking the survey is so bombarded with, with difficult to answer and long questions that they just give up and, and they just start answering uh, and causing your data set to be unreliable. Too many questions. How many is the right amount? Uh, we'll tell you in, in a few slides. Convoluted questions. Questions that are just meandering and difficult to interpret. Uh, double negatives are a great example of this. A uh, question like, true or false, who after this conference would opt out to receive text notifications? I have no idea what I just said. It's just a convoluted double negative statement to avoid. Answer choices that don't line up with how users think and questions that require long or complex answers. Don't ask for a paragraph when a, word, a sentence will do. Don't ask for a sentence when a word will do. Survey fatigue for the user and inactionable data for you, the survey administrator. Uh, you get data back that you just can't use. Answers that could have more than one meaning or answers that are vague. Imagine I gave you a scale of one to 10. Um, how would you rate the conference? And we got back lots of fives and sixes. What are we gonna do with that? That is inactionable. Nothing, there's no, there's no information to be learned by that or action step to be taken. Um, we were chatting with Ben before this uh, conference, uh, before it started, and we talked about how uh, our uh, the one to 10 rating scale is really uh, comes up quite a bit during this presentation. This is the first occurrence of it. Fives and sixes, it's not gonna help you. Nor will answers that don't provide any new information or straight line answering. Straight line answering looks like this. Now we've all seen these matrices before. You've got some kind of chart. Do you strongly agree? Do you strongly disagree? Rate these 10 or five or 20 things. And you find yourself going through it it doesn't matter if it's all neutral or it's all strongly agree or it's all strongly disagree. You just make a straight line because you wanna get through it as quickly as possible, something to avoid. So what do you do instead? Well, for starters, in terms of a good survey, ask about one thing at a time. It seems pretty obvious, but it's out there. You know, far too common uh, to, to see these kind of double barreled questions. How do you feel about your salary and benefits? Well, those are two different questions. How I feel about my salary is completely different from how I feel about my benefits. Ask about one thing at a time. Use simple, familiar words, not technical jargon. I think we're all guilty of this and perhaps increasingly so in the time of COVID as we become more insular and in talking to our own people and our own industries. We use a lot of jargon. Uh, but your audience doesn't always understand it. Uh, I got a survey the other day that asked me, uh, are you happy with your PEO? <laughs> I said, I don't know. What's a PEO? Uh, I had to look it up. Uh, PEO stands for Professional Employment Organization. It's a recruiter, right? It's a headhunter. Recruiters are now calling themselves PEOs, and that's cool. Uh, but you can't expect the, uh, that your, your audience to know that. So uh, stuff to stay away from. Also, stay away from one to 10 rating scales. We'll talk about why. Consider instead reframing the question as either a binary answer, kind of a this or that, or a ranking question, ranking features. Here's what I mean. If I asked you on a scale of one to 10, for those who ate breakfast this morning. How would you rate your breakfast? A couple of things are happening right now. One, you're trying to recall what you had for breakfast. And now you're trying to give it a number. Well, let's see, that was maybe a six or maybe a seven. But here's the problem. Your six is different than my six. And many people don't rate on a scale of one to 10. They'd never rate a one or they never rate a 10. So it's really a scale of two to nine. But more than that, it's that the user has to think about an answer. How would I rate this on a scale? Well, let's see, maybe a, if I, maybe a three, maybe a four. It's work that they have to do. Um, and 
It's work for you, the survey administrator on the back end to do because you've got to interpret all that data. Well, let's see, 12% gave it uh, a two and 14% of the people gave it a four. What are you gonna do with that data? How is it gonna impact the end design, the end product? But if I asked you, did you enjoy your breakfast? Yes or no? One, you can answer that much faster, easily, in fact. You can answer it very easily. Two, the data can be interpreted easily. Oh. 86% of people said, yes, they enjoyed their breakfast. That's real data. That's data you can use. Another option, a ranking system. Imagine you are, you're in the breakfast business and you want to determine when you, and ask users, when it comes down to choosing a breakfast, what's most important to you? Rank these factors, taste, nutrition, calories, et cetera. And you can imagine what your go-to market message would be what your home page message or call to action would be if 80% of the people said, oh, taste, taste is number one. Or if 80% of the people said price or ease or calories. And you can see how that kind of data is much more actionable, much more usable. And you can tailor the message based on the response that you get. Uh, we're a big fan of these types of questions. Avoid words with Ambiguous meanings, yeah. This too is more common than you'd think. Um, Carrie and I, this is a year ago before uh, COVID, we're in a client's office and we were marveling at their impressive signage that they had uh, recently installed. Um, and it said, the headline read, own data. Is own a verb or an adjective? I still don't know. I don't know what they meant. Is it that I get to own the data? Is it my own data and you're going to do something with it? It was just awkward and confusing. Uh, so stuff to avoid. Also to avoid abbreviations. Um, let's try and have fun with the chat window. And I wouldn't mind anyone who wants to in the chat window, just uh, shout out in the chat window. What does CRO stand for? Because I suspect uh, we'll get lots of different things uh, because it does stand for lots of different things. If you Google CRO, I think you get 65 responses. I can't, let's see if I can find the chat. <laughs> I see a crunchy rolled oats, which might be my favorite one. Right? That is a good one. What else is up there, Carrie? I can't access it. What else is up there? So we got chief revenue officer. We yeah. got clinical research organization. We got yeah. a chief recruitment officer. So, All of these are correct, by the way. They are. Did anyone say Croatia? Nobody uh, said Croatia. So avoid abbreviations. Yeah, internally in your in your organization, they mean something, but in the outside world, to the people taking your surveys, they mean something completely different. Be clear, be brief, yes. And don't ask leading questions. What do I mean by that? Again, it's more common than you think. What's an example of a leading question? How short was Napoleon? Again, uh, for those who can access the, the chat window, uh, what's a way to reframe this question that isn't so leading? I will wait for a few seconds. Anything come back? Oh, we got one. What was Napoleon's height? We got a lot yeah. of people. Yeah. That's right. That's it. How would you describe Napoleon's height? Don't ask leading questions. Um, we can talk more about that. In fact, there was a one client who sent out, uh, this is tricky. They sent a survey out to their audience that predated us. And when we joined the team, they were very keen on creating a program that was based on the most leading question I'd ever seen. It was this, an actual survey question. Do you agree with the plans for a program to be undertaken by a third party? <laughs> Each phrase in this is more leading than the next. Do you agree? It's kind of this implied, we agree. Do you, do you agree with us? In fact, do you agree with the plans? We have these plans. We've all made these plans. Perhaps you should agree with us. For this program to be undertaken by a third party, uh, the rewrite of this question uh, uh, is equally leading. It's the same 
type, it's the same question, but I've rewritten it. So say this other group should do the work that they said they would do, don't you think? That's basically the question that they asked. Problem is our client asked this, again, predated us. They asked this of their audience and well, their entire audience said yes. 98% said, oh yeah, that sounds really good. Um, I always wonder who was the 2% who said no. Problem was though, when ultimately the, the client put that program into, into practice, it failed because it was based on an incredibly leading question uh, and has to be taken with a grain of salt. So something to avoid, make sure that you're not doing that. Otherwise- That's right. And I'll add that they spent a lot of money and resources implementing that program. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, just, just trying to get the answers you want isn't gonna magically make people do what you would like them to do. That's right. Uh, that way you are, you're using data uh, the way a drunkard uses a light post for support rather than for illumination. Uh, don't do that. If you're the sort of person who enjoys taking screenshots, uh, this is a good one to take. But even after I say that, I'm now going to advance the screen, so we'll see if you got it in quickly enough. Okay. All right. Um, so we've heard the do's and don'ts. Um, now let's get into uh, some considerations uh, when you're actually starting to put together your survey. And we'll start with when you're when you're very first starting out constructing your survey. Um, and this is perhaps uh, the most important slide of this entire presentation. And that is that you need to prepare a list of your objectives and how well you've done this really, uh, it hugely impacts how easy or difficult it is for you to even put together your survey in the, in the first place. If you have a very clear objective going in, the questions will practically write themselves. If you don't have a clear objective, then what ends up happening is you're just uh, writing down a list of questions of stuff that you think might be neat to know that may or may not be useful. Um, and so it's going to be really hard to give your survey a focus. It's going, you, you know, it's going to be a gamble whether or not the data that you get back from your survey is going to be usable. Um, but if you've taken the time to really understand why you're putting the survey out in the field in the first place, what it is that you're trying to learn and what you're going to do with that information, then you're gonna have a much easier time, A, writing the survey and B, interpreting the data whenever it comes back. Um, so some examples of, of an objective that you might have going in is maybe you have a new feature that you're considering uh, and you're just trying to gauge interest in whether or not uh, this is a good investment for your team. Uh, maybe you have a whole feature list and you're trying to figure out uh, at, in what order you need to, to fund and assign resources uh, to implementing these features. Uh, maybe you're doing a branding exercise and you're trying to use language that resonates with your users. So you're just trying to learn how other people are describing your organization's value. Um, or the most common one, and probably the surveys you've seen the most in your own inbox, maybe you're just trying to figure out what the level is of customer satisfaction with you as a company or your product. Uh, something else to consider when you're first putting together your survey is to maybe kick it off um, with some sort of self-identification question. And it doesn't have to be the first question, you can move it to be the last question, but, but having some question in there that helps you be able to make distinctions between how one part of your audience answers question versus another is gonna be of great value to you when you actually start getting your answers back. So for example, let's imagine, um, Let's imagine you're a bank and you're sending a survey out to all your customers, but you want to know the difference between uh, how your business customers answer questions versus how your personal banking customers answer questions, because they could be answering things two different ways. And maybe that means you need to message to those two groups a little bit differently. Um, you know, maybe it's two different product experiences. Maybe you're a university and you're sending a survey out to everyone, but you need to know who is a, a current student, who is staff, who is alumni. Um, that would be a good example of a self-identification question. And what this, this is gonna do is you're gonna get that data back. You're gonna be able to segment your data by audience. You're gonna be able to analyze the results for each of those groups. 
Um, and you may need to come up with a different plan for each group. Um, but you know, there, there are cases where sometimes the messaging is gonna be the same for more than one group. And that's valuable information to have as well. Uh, this is extremely important. Uh, <laughs> you want to make sure that you do ask some open-ended questions and you want to ask them first. Um, so the reason why you want to ask open-ended questions is because you want to give people an opportunity to talk to you in their own words. This goes back to what we were saying earlier about wanting to learn the language people use when they're talking about you and when they're talking about their product. So act, asking them an open-ended questions gives people the opportunity to do that. So an example of an open-ended question might be, uh, why do you use this product and see how they describe the task it is that they're, they're doing with your product most often. Um, maybe you want to ask them uh, what, how they would describe what your company does to someone else and see what words they're using to describe what their company does. Um, <clears throat> and when you ask these open-ended questions, and I'd say put in about two or three at the start, you can put in more if you want to, but I think two or three is a, is a, is a good solid number. Um, you wanna make sure that you're asking them at the beginning of the survey. And I'd be curious if anybody had a guess as to why we're saying to put your open-ended questions first. So we'll give you a couple minutes. If you have an idea, maybe just type it in the chat. Why it's important to begin with open-ended questions. We have some good guesses. There we go, somebody's got it. So you don't anchor their language with your word choices. That's exactly right. I like that word anchor. I'm going to now use the word anchor. <laughs> yeah, she's influenced your word choices. That's what's happened. <laughs> That's exactly right. So what happens is if you give people multiple choice questions and then ask them an open-ended question, they're automatically going to start mirroring the language that you just presented to them in your previous questions and your multiple choice questions and unfortunately we learned that the hard way that's right we had a, we had a survey and a project early early on early days uh and we were very eager to impress our the client and so when the client suggested hey let's not begin with an open-ended question let's start with a radio button or a check-in box so that people can ease into the survey we were naive and we agreed but then when the data came back, it was just as Carrie said, everyone's text was nearly verbatim what our previous answers, what our previous questions were. So the open-ended question trying to gauge what language the users used was worthless. Yeah, they were garbage. <laughs> so don't do that. Uh, so moving on, <clears throat> let's say you've got you've got your questions written down, you've put together your survey, and now you're trying to figure out how to send it out uh, to your audience. Um, and so I've seen, um, believe it or not, I've seen a lot of people try to do this in, in a variety of ways, including just typing it up in a document and sending that document to a, a BCC <laughs> long list of people. And we're here to tell you not to do that. Um, don't don't try to go uh, a rogue or, or DIY when you're sending a survey out to a group of people. There's really no reason to do that. Um, so <clears throat> there are pre-existing survey platforms that have been around a long time. SurveyMonkey and SurveyGizmo are two that we use uh, very often. Uh, and they actually have free account options that are very functional. It's not a situation where you have to have a paid account in order to get a functional survey out into the field. Um, but the advantage of this is a few things. One, privacy. So you're sending it out to a bunch of people, but they're not, you know, you don't have the risk that you have when you just have a bunch of BCC people on an email list. Um, two, there's already tools built into this platform that allow you to segment your data and analyze your data to visualize your data. You're not having to collect all this data yourself, put it in a spreadsheet, and then try to make these uh, elaborate chart, uh, charts and pivot tables in Excel. Um, and uh, thirdly, if you're a person that's doing a general audience survey and you need to recruit an audience, this is going to be the best way to do that. Um, you know, 
we have had situations in the past uh, when we've had to make attempts to recruit our own audience uh, outside of a professional audience recruitment service or through something like SurveyMonkey. And it's extremely time consuming. You don't wanna do that. Like it sounds like a good idea, but just the amount of time it takes to the, then go out, especially if you have a targeted audience to seek those people out, seek out those groups, try to get their contact information, get your survey to them in a way that's not getting you into trouble with a forum administrator. It's just uh, a lot of hassle that's uh, entirely unnecessary. Uh, so if you go through um, SurveyMonkey or SurveyGizmo, uh, you know, your opportunity to recruit an audience is, is going to be uh, a lot easier. Yeah, we're not sponsored in any way by SurveyMonkey or SurveyGizmo, uh, but we should be. And we have um, a, a tip from Danielle. She says Survey Gizmos changed their name to Alchemer, so don't be confused if you see that change. It's a good. Oh, that's right. I did see that tip. very recently. Yeah. Pro tip. Mm -hmm. I should probably update this presentation. I'm making a note. <laughs> um, <clears throat> one thing to note is to keep your survey short. And I think uh, we've seen people get prickly about this in the past. And it's because there's this inclination, I think, when, when surveys go out, uh, a few things happen. One, a lot of times people are going in and writing these surveys and they did not have a clear objective going in. So they are sort of just asking a meandering list of questions of stuff they think it might be neat to know. Um, but another thing that I think happens a lot is you'll have an organization, somebody will say, I'm hey, I'm, I'm sending a survey out in the field about X, Y, Z, and then someone else will say, oh, I also had uh, some questions about this other thing I'm working on. Let's just tack it on to your survey and we'll send it out all together. Maybe you have three different groups surveys all going out at once. And I think in their mind, they're like, oh, we just have to send out a survey one time. It'll be long, but that's fine we'll just send out one long survey. The problem with that is that as soon as your survey exceeds 10 questions, there is a precipitous drop off in the response rate. So you're just not going to get the number of responses that you want um, once your survey starts spiraling out. Uh, and 10 does seem to be the magic number. There's very, very um, few exceptions to this rule, but if you have a clear objective going in and you're not asking a bunch of ranking questions and you're really focused on trying to get actual information that you can use, it actually becomes a pretty easy task to keep your survey condensed into 10 or fewer questions. Um, sometimes you can even get a useful one survey question and- uh, We love one, we love one survey questions, uh, one question surveys, I should say. Uh, I took one the other day, this is, uh, this is some time ago now. Uh, I was uh, flying and uh, I had a bad experience with my airline. I know it's, it's hard to believe, uh, but I was I was angry. It was a it was a terrible uh, mishap, uh, you know, in terms of delays. And I was I was angry and I wanted to call and give them a piece of my mind and maybe get some bonus miles out of the deal. So I called up, uh, spoke with the, the customer service rep. And she listened to me and I probably yelled a lot uh, and I got some miles, which was nice. And the end message was stay tuned for a one question survey. I'm like, great. I love surveys. I'm the one guy who likes to take surveys. And the question was this, if you were the president of a customer service uh, telecommunications company, would you hire the person you just spoke with? And I thought, wow, what a great question. I mean, that just cuts right to the heart of it. it. It takes the emotion out of, well, I was angry and I was still angry and furious with the airline, but I had a good experience with the, the, the customer rep. And it was about that. It was about a very narrow objective about how was your experience with the customer rep? And I said, yes, I would hire her. I thought she did a great job. Uh, one question surveys, uh, they can be uh, incredibly powerful and impactful. That's right. So uh, one question that we also get asked a lot is uh, how many people should take our survey? And the problem with this question is that giving an absolute number really depends. Um, it, it's difficult because it depends entirely on how many people you're sending the survey out to. Um, so, you know, the number of people 
you want to respond to a survey that you've sent out to maybe only 10 people is going to be really different than the optimal number for a survey that you've sent out to a thousand people. Um, so what we tell people is this one obviously you're trying to collect the largest data set you can so make sure you're putting together your survey keeping it short and sweet and clear so that you can get the maximum number of responses um, and two <clears throat> what you can expect typically is a 10 to 15 percent response rate that's a, that's an okay that's an acceptable response rate now that said the response rate that we typically get from our surveys that we're putting out in the field tends to be more in that 25 to 30 percent range um, and if you follow the tips that we're giving you today i think you can probably expect something closer to that range too and we have in the past had people that attended this workshop come back to us and say wow i can't believe it i'm getting a 25 30 percent response rate now and before we were getting in the you know single digits so uh, it really does make a big impact um, <clears throat> Another thing uh, to help ensure that you're getting the number of responses that you want is to make sure you're sending reminder emails out. So <clears throat> we have seen a lot of people in the past that just they put together their survey, they send it out in the field, and then they just let it go. And then that they came back and checked in a week and that was it. But the thing is, is there's a missed opportunity there because they only sent out the, the one email. Um, what you want to do is you want to send your survey out, and then you want to send two reminder emails two two is the the optimal number and and this is taking place over roughly one to two weeks um and if i think of the next slide we'll take a look at what that schedule might look like it looks like this so we like to send them out on tuesdays and thursdays for uh, a couple of reasons one it's documented and two it's it follows the common sense most people come in on monday and they're too busy uh, and most people on Friday, they just want to get out of there uh, and, and close their laptop for the day. But Tuesdays and Thursdays are more active days. Uh, and so if you send your first email on a Tuesday and follow it up on a Thursday and then the following Tuesday, you'll see this progression where open rates and click throughs are highest on the first day. And then they kind of get halved with each consequent uh, reminder send. Um, and this is always the case. This has been the case for us, certainly for the past five years and, and probably well beyond, uh, where no matter what the engagement, no matter what the audience, no matter what the topic, the first day is big and then it gets halved and then it gets halved again and you, you, you kind of peter out. Uh, we did have one client uh, who was felt very strongly that was not going to be the case for them. Uh, this client, uh, she managed a team of physicians, of doctors, uh, and the survey went out to the doctors. And she said, oh, doctors are, they're notorious at waiting to the last minute. They're gonna, they won't do anything until it's down to the wire and you'll see your biggest increase on the, on the last day. That's right. She was convinced that this pattern for her audience was going to be reversed. Yeah, spoiler alert, it wasn't. It was uh, not reversed. It was this exact same pattern. And this is something that comes up a lot. We often will have people say, no, 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 my survey is different or my audience is going to behave differently. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that it's probably not. Um, <laughs> there's almost a 0% chance that this group of 100 people is going to follow a different pattern than another group of 100 people when taking a survey. Um, so. I, you could feel pretty good um, about expecting this pattern. Um, and the nice thing about it is the, the fact that the audio, all audiences behave fairly consistently means that you can get a pretty predictable result when you're getting surveys out into the field. And to that point, if that first Tuesday response comes in and it's not where you want it to be, then there's something wrong. Then there's something wrong with either the survey that you've created or the promotional email that, that's triggering people to participate in the survey. So you do need to reevaluate because okay. it's not going to grow from there. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, you see the little the, the timestamp 10, uh, 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. Those are great times to send. Uh, similarly, you don't want to bookend the days of the week, Mondays and Fridays. You don't want to send the first thing in the morning or the last thing in the evening. So shoot for 11 and 2 p.m., 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. if you can. That's right. Uh, so if the 
objective is the most important part of writing a survey, then I would say that this is the second most important part of writing a survey. And this is the subject line that's going in the email that you're sending out to people. Um, and the reason we say that is because if nobody takes your survey and they all delete the email that you send and they don't, they don't read it, they don't click on the link, then you don't have a survey, you don't have any responses. Um, so <clears throat> you need a subject line that's gonna get people to not delete the email, save the email and click on the link in the email. And some things that we've had pretty great success with over the years, some things that we've learned that we'd like to share with you today. One, we've had great success when we've included the words invitation or reminder at the beginning of the subject line with a colon. That colon is a key part of this recipe. Um, Dan and I each have different ideas about why this word with the colon is effective. My theory is that the word invitation with the colon or reminder with the colon looks like it came from your Outlook calendar, so it looks important. And mine is simply, I think that the colon makes helps break up your subject line and make it a bit more scannable. Mm -hmm. And they're probably both uh, true to some extent, but the important thing here is including that in your subject line, extremely helpful for getting responses. Uh, and then including the amount of time it will take to complete, or at least uh, how long your survey is, if it's very short, if it's just three questions, something to set that expectation of how much that person has to invest. If you can let them know at the outset, this is only gonna take them two minutes, or they only have to answer three questions, they're more likely to click on that link. Because if they don't know, then they could click on that link and it could be taking to them them to a, a 50 question survey of a bunch of one to 10 rankings that they don't want to answer. And they're not going to risk that because they don't have 20 minutes, but they might have two minutes and they might have time to answer uh, three questions. Um, so that's extremely important. And in the same spirit of setting expectations, including the survey topic in the subject line, extremely helpful uh, because if you don't, then there's a chance that they're gonna go, oh, this survey is probably not for me. I probably don't have enough information to answer these questions. But if you have a topic in there, then they know that it's relevant to them. So now they have something to keep them from deleting the email, this word with the colon. Now they have uh, expectation of, of the low time investment it's gonna take them to do it. They're like, oh, I have time for this. And they know that it's relevant to something that they know about because they can see the topic. So these are the magic ingredients for uh, a survey subject line uh, for an email that's gonna get you actual clicks. And we have a few examples. Mm -hmm. The first is pretty generic. It's, it's a classic for a reason. A invitation, tell us, tell us how you feel in two minutes. Uh, this idea of, of sharing your, your thoughts, tell us how you feel really performs well. You've got two minutes, you've got invitation. And really, to reinforce a point that Carrie made, uh, the we get so many emails in our inbox these days, the purpose of a subject line isn't even to get opened. It's to not get deleted. And something with this framework, invitation colon two minutes, sticks around, uh, lingers in your inbox, won't get deleted. So too, invitation, happier patience in four minutes. Talk about you know, what's the promise that you're delivering? What are they going to get? Uh, what's the end goal of the survey? What's uh, certainly it, it, it speaks to the subject matter. It's something about uh, patient population, uh, but it's 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 putting uh, the positive on what what they're going to receive. And again, it's only four minutes. Reminder: reduce carbon emission. A three-minute survey. Uh, you start to see the pattern here. Uh, these for the reminders, talking about what it is. It's only three minutes. There's reminder. And I think lastly, reminder, eight questions about your dream car. Uh, the, the, the length of the survey doesn't always have to be time. It can simply be the number of questions. Uh, but again, there's that, there's that uh, template and they're templated because they work. Mm -hmm. And After now you don't have to think about it. You don't have to spend a bunch of time agonizing over how you're gonna come up with a subject line that's gonna get people to click on it. You just follow this recipe and boom, you've got a subject line that's gonna work. Yeah, and I would urge uh, whenever possible, be clear uh, rather than being clever when it comes to subject lines. Yeah, well, when it comes to anything, if you ask Dan, but especially with subject lines, yes. That's true. All right.
Again, if you're the sort who likes screenshots, this is a good one, do's and don'ts. And this much, uh, must mean we're up to uh, real world examples. Before we get to real world examples, uh, could be a good opportunity to pause. I see some activity in the chat window uh, and check in uh, to see if there are any recent questions that we should address before moving on. Yeah, um, we do have one uh, question. Uh, do you believe in motivating surveyors by promising any type of gift? Um, and this is one that uh, comes up a lot. Uh, so this is one of those questions that is like, uh, <clears throat> basically asking if uh, paying someone to take your survey is okay. And typically we don't recommend it um, simply because it's not necessary. Uh, if someone's not inclined to take your survey, they're not going to be exponentially more inclined if they're offered uh, a couple a couple bucks to do it. Um, it's just an unnecessary expense. But if they only know it's going to take two minutes and it's about a topic they already know about it, they're probably going to click on that link and they're probably going to take the survey. Um, <clears throat> and you're also going to get uh, more reliable answers from people that you didn't have to bribe into taking the survey. You're asking for such a small effort and time investment that you really want people to just want to give you those answers on their own accord. I think that that information is a little more trustworthy than someone who is just quickly trying to get a uh, dollar or five dollars. True. Any other questions before we move on? Let's see. Uh, we have a question about the max number of questions uh, on a scale of one to five. How would you rate the following six rows of it? She says she has stakeholders who want to pack these in. Mm -hmm. um, but then she's worried that the users are aren't fooled and you risk the responses on the rows being relative and not individual. I think that's true. I mean, in general, what we're going to tell you is don't have scale of one to five questions anything you can do to talk someone out of including those in a survey uh, is going to be valuable have them move to a binary question if they really you know if it's are you happy with this the answer is yes or no maybe uh an option of i don't know um you know just in case that if that's a factor um but just keeping those those scale questions out of your survey is going to make that data that comes back uh, much more actionable and you're more inclined to have a higher response rate because people didn't get tired of trying to assign a number of something that isn't naturally something they would assign a number to. That's so true. And again, you'll avoid that fatigue and straight line answering where people say, you know what, I'm just going to give everything a five or I'm going to give everything a four. Mm -hmm. uh, for all these reasons, we don't like those numerical scales. Um, I see just a quick uh, housekeeping note. Uh, the, I've spoken with the ATO organizers. Uh, we, while this uh, session is broken into two 45-minute sessions, we are going to power through. Uh, so we won't have a break, but we'll probably end a little early. Uh, and, we'll, and we'll continue on. Any other questions before we do so? OK, let's keep going. Because now we're going to have some fun. These are real world examples. So what we're going to share with you now are a series of survey questions, select survey questions, that we've asked over the years, real clients, real products, real websites. And we're going to share with you the data that came back and talk about how this one survey question affected change, changed a product, changed a message. <clears throat> and we'll go through a bunch of these. The first of which, is for uh, software as a service, business analytics in the hospitality space. <clears throat> so if you've ever stayed at a Hilton or a Hyatt or a Hampton Inn or any other place that begins with H, they would use this software uh, to do their, manage their revenue. And as uh, Kerry talked about, we began with an open-ended question. We asked, uh, gosh, it was 400 uh, their clients. We said simply, what do you use the software to do? Now, this is a word cloud that graphically represents all the answers that came back. The larger the word, the more it was used. Very clear. It said, forecasting. We use this product for forecasting. If you look at a big word forecast, and then even underneath it is forecasts and forecasting. It's all over the place. In fact, 72% of the audience said, forecasting is what we use it for. Now, here's the funny thing. The word forecasting didn't appear anywhere. 
not in the client's product, not on the client's website. They had that capability. That's what they did, but they didn't call it forecasting. They called it planning. And that's just different. It's just this, this irritating disconnect of internal language versus external language. And it's that that we're trying to uh, mitigate so that when it comes time to speak to your customers, your audience, you can speak to them with the language that they use. Now, when you go to this website, it says forecasting all over the place. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it, it, it's in their main call to action on their homepage. It's on their main navigation on the product. It's, change, it's, it's using the language that makes sense to your users. This is another survey. It's a different question, a different client, different product. Uh, this one was for a uh, field service management company that uses mobile forms. So field service management is anyone who's out in the field, the uh, person who fixes your HVAC or refills a termite bait station or a visiting nurse. And traditionally they'll have a pen and paper and a clipboard and they'll write down information and they'll bring it back to the home company. Uh, this company provided all that on a mobile form of tablet. But they had a very distinct problem, they thought. They said, listen, we have two very different audiences. We have uh, clients who are small companies, these mom and pop shops. And then we have these large companies, these uh, enterprise Fortune 500 companies. And they said, we can't possibly speak to them with the same voice. And Carrie and I put a survey in the field and we said, of course you can, because look at the data. We segment, we had users self-identify small versus large. And for these purposes, small was anything under hundred people and large was anything over hundred people employees. And whether you're a small company or a large company, you both like the same things. We asked them, when it comes time to make a purchase decision with a field service management company, what's most important to you? Reliability and ease of use, number one and number two, no matter if you're big or small. And this way we were able to really provide uh, comfort to the client say, you can go out with the same message to two disparate audiences because they both care about the same things. Now, sure, some things are different. Small companies care more about system integration. And large companies care more about breadth of functionality. And you can address that, you know, in the pages that follow and the, somewhere in the internals of the website. But as far as main messaging, you can speak to both audiences uh, with one single voice. And it was more impactful. This is another one, a different survey, a different client, a different product. This was for a commercial real estate company. Uh, they provided construction. They would renovate uh, old spaces like uh, warehouses and such and turn them into co-working spaces like we work. And here the client had very specific thoughts. They wanted to go to market with a message uh, that was twofold. That was about tax depreciation incentives and energy efficiency. And they said, these are our distinguishing characteristics. Uh, this is what will motivate people to purchase from us. Tax depreciation incentives and energy efficiency. Carrie's laughing. <laughs> I just think it's really funny how much he really clung to the fact that tax depreciation incentives is really going to resonate with everyone. It, it, to this day, it, it tickles me. Uh, to this day, I think he, he's, still, he's still trying to, to, to sell that. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're absolutely right. Uh, so we, this is an example of a ranking question. So instead of ranking, you know, why you would choose your breakfast, here we're ranking, well, when it comes time to make a purchase decision with a, uh, you know, construction company like this one, what's most important? Price and speed. Pretty straightforward. Uh, and you can see on the bottom in red, energy efficiency and tax depreciation incentives. So when it came time to design that site and that product, it was, the main call to action message was all about price and speed and design aesthetics, which again, the client did not think was going to perform uh, that well. One of the great things that surveys do, and it's exemplified here, it takes the guesswork out of it. And it also takes the, if I, you know, if one can say the, the politics out of it. You know, I, I, I get it, you know, you, you've got someone who sits at the head of the table and they say, I think it should be this. I think we should do this and I'm going with my gut. And that's great. 
but <laughs> you can use data to, to argue that, to combat that. And here it was very real, um, where you're not uh, thinking about what one person thinks, but the collective of your audience thinks, and you can show that data. And that's what this slide shows. I think we have one more. Now this. This is my favorite kind of survey. This is an exit survey. Why is it your favorite kind? Because it's so short and it's so effective. It's like, it's just so much bang for your buck. It's, it's, it is. Uh, it's two questions. It's two questions. This two question survey was placed on a huge pharmaceutical uh, firm's uh, website. This website seen uh, in, gosh, I wanna say nearly a hundred countries. They have more than 70,000 employees and they just went through at the time this survey was deployed, uh, the timing was a little uh, awkward. They, they, they built their website and then they called us. It happens. Um, they had redesigned their website spending, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars on it. And we put this simple two question survey in the field that dismissed it. We asked, were you able to find what you were looking for? More than two thirds said no. More than two thirds of the audience that came to this, this huge uh, multinational conglomerate of $10 billion in revenue said, no, I couldn't find what I was looking for. As an aside, I will say that this company had spent a lot of money on a redesign that was done without any um, user research ahead of time. Yeah, they went with their gut. Yeah. Um, Two thirds couldn't find what they were looking for, which begs the question, well, what were you looking for? Which is in fact, the second question. Of those who said, yes, I was able to find what I was looking for. They were looking for jobs, career data, information about how, you know, a job. Now, you, you know, obviously this, this company with $10 billion in revenue did not redesign their website just to get job applicants. They were getting them anyway. Uh, so this was, uh, this was not a win. Uh, those that could not find what they were looking for, they were looking for data and they could not find it, specifically data built around the therapeutic units that this client offered, diabetes, depression, Alzheimer's, et cetera. So now simple two question survey revolutionized that design and changed the way that company has their website such that now when you go to it, it's a, firstly, it says data all over the place, but it also talks about, uh, has a navigation that's dedicated to data. Um, that's that's another thing. People always using the navigation to infer what what's the offering. And when you go up to their main navigation, it talks about data is the number one thing and has a drop down of, of different data types. So that's an exit survey. That's right. And we do have a question um, about uh, what's the best strategy for following up with this type of survey with an exit survey. Um, and so. <clears throat> Really, um, you don't have to do a lot of follow up because what's happening here is there's a pop up that's actually coming up on the website when someone's going to leave. Um, and SurveyMonkey offers this functionality. And in fact, I think that's what we used uh, for this survey question in particular. Um, but it's just going to collect that data for you and you're going to be able to track it and you're going to be able to turn that survey on and off whenever you're ready. Let's say you just want to collect the first 1000 responses, you can do that and then turn it off and then you have that data. So you don't have to do a lot of active following up for this one. Uh, and then it's a matter of uh, packaging up and, and sharing it with uh, your, your stakeholders and your decision makers. Uh, it's often it's hard to refute. Mm -hmm. That's right. Any other questions at this moment? Well, in fact, now is time for uh, two types of questions. Uh, certainly as questions continue to come in about uh, the information that Carrie and I just shared with you, uh, any kind of uh, clarifying questions, by all means, continue to keep those coming. In addition, what we'd like to do for the next 15 minutes to a half hour uh, is put some sample questions in the field and, and work on them with you uh, to, to, to craft and to optimize. We've come up with, we'll say several uh, sample objectives. You, you heard Carrie talk about how important uh, the objective uh, for your survey is. And so uh, together we, we've come up with some, uh, some role-playing objectives 
uh, that we'd like to share with you and then discuss with you the types of questions uh, that, uh, that could inform our objectives. Carrie, how, how does that sound? I think that sounds great. We did have one more question come in, uh, someone asking about intercepts. Uh, so the, I'm assuming you mean those little um, pop-ups that come when you're like you're on a website and something comes up while you're kind of mid-task and it's asking you if you want to go take this survey. Um, and the question was about whether we had any tips about uh, you know wording choices or you know, ideal times for them to pop up. And I will say um, we just don't use intercepts a lot, um, and the reason why is because people find them irritating. Um, and so one thing that we try really hard to do is make sure we're we're getting people to come in and take these surveys in a way that we're not irritating them. So with an exit survey, we're okay with that little pop up <clears throat> because it's coming up when they're presumably done with their task and they're leaving. Um, but we personally don't have a lot of recommendations for intercepts just because we try to avoid uh, using them whenever we can. Uh, we just don't like to interrupt uh, a task, an active task to try and get people to come take a survey. Good question. It's a great, great question. Any others before we move on? Okay. So let's take a look at these sample objectives. And these are, you know, really to, to inspire thought, use them, uh, don't use them, you, you use your other, uh, you use your own objectives. And let's take a look at them. One potential objective for a survey, imagine uh, that you are responsible for planning the next All Things Open conference. Imagine that you're planning, uh, you're already hard at work, uh, which uh, uh, is, is scary to think about, uh, given that we're already in this one. Uh, and you're planning the next ATO conference. Think about if that's your objective, what are some questions that you might want to answer? Now, we don't want to, uh, to Carrie's point, well, normally we, we don't want to exceed 10, but for the purposes of this exercise, we, you can keep it to one or two or three key questions that you might want to ask. Yeah, and we'll give you a couple minutes uh, to think of a couple questions that you would want to include on a survey you were sending out with this objective. Um, and then <clears throat> you can put them in the chat and then we'll take a couple minutes uh, to go through them. Uh, and talk about uh, which questions we agree that would be great to include, or if there's a, a better way to word a question, we'll talk about that. We'll give it, I don't know, like a minute. Sounds good. I'm looking at your picture in the corner over here as if it looks like I'm looking at you, but it, it doesn't. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at your picture. <laughs> And thank you both to Carrie and, and, and Ben for, for helping us with, uh, as the questions come in, helping me. I can't, because I'm sharing my screen, it makes it difficult to actually see the chat window. It's an odd thing. And Ben, we talked about this might be an opportunity for attendees to raise their hand if they want to ask, uh, ask their questions aloud. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So if anybody wants to speak directly with their microphone, uh, raise your hand and then we can uh, allow you to speak. Um. <laughs> we can allow you to speak. Uh, so we'll have this uh, sample objective, then we'll have another one. But also, if you have your own business objectives, you know, you, you have your, you know, you're representing your own company and you know what your plans are or challenges that are facing you either this year or next, and you want to address those, uh, we can do that as well. All right, we'll give it. 20 more seconds and then we'll see what kind of questions everybody's got. Yeah, this is normally the part of the presentation where we divide the, the room into groups and the groups work on them and we will walk around and overhear things. Uh, so thank you for your patience with us as we, we try this uh, new enterprise during COVID.
All right. <clears throat> we'll call it. Anybody have a question they'd like to share that they would include in a survey if they were trying to plan the ATO conference for next year? Here, we've got a good one from Amanda. What specific topics would you like to see covered at next year's ATO conference? And I think she's asking this as an open-ended question. Is that correct, Amanda? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great open-ended question, um, specifically because that is a great opportunity to see what language somebody is using, because you want to make sure that the, the conference topic titles are matching up with how people are thinking about those topics in their mind. Uh, we have another one from India. Rank the following topics from most important to least important. Insert list of topics. I think that's another great way to ask that question. Um, <clears throat> are there any topics that you would like to be presented at next year's conference? So that would be the open-ended way, similar to Amanda's. Um, we have one from Sean. What's one thing you would change about this year's conference? I love that question. Um, it, it's something that uh, Dan and I include in a lot of surveys is a question that's something along the lines of what would you change if you could add anything, if you had a magic wand, and any kind of thinking where someone's having to really use their imagination to say what it is they would want if they could have anything. And yeah. I'm, thinking about, I'm thinking about the results. Uh, these are great questions. I'm thinking about how those results, how the answers would influence any of the materials and you know, for example, you know, do people say, in, in terms of topics that they're interested in, what are the words that they that they use? Do they say design? Do they say UX? Do, do they say product? Do they say creative? Uh, so that you know, when it comes time for the organize the organizers of the event to categorize them, they can categorize them using the language that the respondents chose, not the language that you know the internal planning committee chose. Go ahead, Carrie, what, what was another one? Oh, uh, we got a good one from Rebecca, which I think is uh, specifically relevant now, which is what open source technology do you anticipate will be important to your role within the next two years? Mm -hmm. So having people be able to describe kind of what they're doing at their, at their current job so you can make sure that you're picking a topic that's relevant to them, I think is a, is a great uh, question. And I like that this one, um, is a little bit more specific because it shows that you are in touch with what your attendees are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And we have one from Madeline. Uh, what extra amenities would you like to have available to you at the next ATO? That one I would probably ask is a multiple choice question. That's a good one. Do you have any thoughts about that, Dan, about how you would yeah, and so much as that that does sound like one where you can imagine, let's say you are in the planning committee and you do you you internally propose some some changes, some enhancements. And I'm sure some of them cost more than others. You can you can put them up uh, to your audience for ranking uh, so that before you commit resources, before you spend money on, hey, someone says, I think it'd be a great idea if we provided X, Y, and Z. You can find out from your audience if they truly are interested in X, Y, and Z. It actually reminds me of a, a product we had uh, for a client not too long ago. They developed this mapping technology. Uh, and it was, it was they, they took the time to map where, uh, suffice it to say, they had uh, representatives with customers located all over the United States. And this map basically showed the representatives where their customers were. Uh, and we asked users about that in a, in a different, uh, using a different research methodology. Uh, but all the answers came back the same saying, I don't care about this map. I know where my customers are. I don't need this. Uh, so yeah, I think it is a great question to rank your internal, you know, you've got some possible discussion topics or enhancements, put them to the test, let your audience decide wh what's most important to them. So yeah, it's a good question. Great one. Good job, everyone. That was awesome. Let's move on to the next. So imagine you're an office manager and you're being charged with uh, determining uh, what do people need uh, to feel good about returning to the office uh, during, during uh, the days we live in. And this could be, you could take it any, any one of a couple of places. Certainly you could be the office manager for, you know, 
one company who, who works in one building and you're, you know, and, and you want to determine uh, if they're, if people are ready to get back to work in the office. Uh, or imagine you are, say, in a, a larger building and it is a co-working space and you have many tenants and you want to, you need that business to continue on and you want to see what it would take to get your tenants to come in. So here too, we'll take a couple of minutes. You can think about the types of questions you might want to ask uh, based on this objective. And I will uh, throw this one out there. I'll come back to the slide in a moment, but I, I will just for just throw this out there. If you are you know, positing your own uh, business objectives, happy to share those uh, as well. And you can, you can do that in chat. Mm -hmm. And again, in, in summary, once you firm up this objective, it makes it easier to have a narrow focus of questions, have fewer questions, so that you don't have this long meandering survey. And you can really get right to the heart of it in just a few questions. We'll give it about 20 more seconds. All right, perfect. We've got a few questions here. One from Joshua. Uh, would you feel comfortable coming back to the office if precautions were introduced? And I could see this being a, a binary question. Um, but then he has a follow-up question of what precautions are important to you? And there's um, a list of items for them to select check boxes. And I think check boxes would be a good approach to that question. Uh, I also think uh, a ranking question could, could work here. So they're ranking uh, how things are, uh, important things are to them uh, in ascending order. Uh, I think that's a good one. Any, any other ideas about how you would implement the precautions question, Dan? Could you reread it? It seemed a little, I wonder if we can. What precautions are important to you? And then Joshua wanted to approach it as a list of items with check boxes. So you could check off as many items as were uh, important to someone. Okay, yeah, sure. Um... Sure, there's some statistical analysis of it. I like to, uh, I like to have only a few, the ability to select a few questions, a few check it boxes. Let's say that there are seven or ten items, and you can only choose three. Mm. Uh, I think that that really focuses one's attention. Um, you get people again. You that that you eliminate that kind of nebulous answering of well, everyone checked everything, which sometimes people right. do. Yeah, so it forces people to have to make a choice about what's most important to them. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's a good one. You're so smart, Dan. <laughs> Let's start an agency. Um, and then we have one uh, from Allie. Describe the adaptations to the office that ideally would be made for you to feel comfortable working in the building. So this sounds like, to me, an open-ended question.
Yeah, I'm, and perhaps I'm, I'm using my own background as a, as a bias, which I shouldn't do. But I was asked this question, uh, that, that very question, uh, well, what would make you feel safe to come back? Um, and I said, uh, a vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but it's, I, I call it out so that we're careful that uh, you only want to ask that which you can control. Right. That makes sense. Uh, we have another one, another open-ended question that I like this one a lot. Um, it's from India. How do you feel about returning to the office? Mm. Um, and I think that for a, such a, a, a charged uh, topic as this one, people have really strong feelings about returning to the office versus not having that open-ended question opening with it, I think really gives you kind of a weather check with people's emotions and where they're at. You could send the survey out, get a get 100 responses with that open-ended question and i can imagine that the language that's used about how you feel about returning to the office is really going to give you a window into whether or not it's even a viable solution in the short term uh future i think that's exactly right i mean imagine the circumstances for why the survey goes out maybe it's uh, again drawing my own experience another company there's a ceo who feels very strongly that everyone should be in the office for better mm -hmm. or for worse. you can imagine uh if they're how emotionally charged that 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 singular question is if those responses come back to that ceo that the ceo would have to acknowledge the emotion um it's hard to refute as i've said before so yeah i think that's a great question mm -hmm. and india also had another one a binary question if the office opened up in x amount of time would you work in person or would you work from home mm. that is a good question Mm -hmm. And then we have another question from Sean, an open-ended question, what concerns you most about coming back to the office? Yeah, that's kind of, uh, so in terms of open-ended questions, I think that, uh, that, that earlier one really uh, works. There's some action steps I think you can take from it. You know, uh, what was it, how do you feel about coming back to the office? What concerns you about it? I guess that there could be some action steps there, but I, 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 I would just be, I always try and think of. <laughs> Ellie you know, said people, people would answer getting COVID. <laughs> right? <laughs> so you have to guard against that. It's, it's tricky getting COVID. Yes. That, <laughs> uh, and so it's, it's tricky to, to, to craft that such that you get actionable answers you can use. Yeah, we got a couple more here that are really good. So I wanna make sure we get to them. Um, Claire uh, asks, what company arrangements would keep you from returning to the office? So what would make you not want to come back in? And I think that's a really good, that's a good and fair question to ask. I think this is one where you definitely would have to want to introduce some sort of list because I think people would have a hard time imagining on their own. Like, I think they would have a hard time answering that particular question as an open-ended question. Mm -hmm. But if you gave people a list of hypotheticals um, and maybe did the choose choose three out of 10 or, or whatever it is, uh, like Dan was describing with the other question earlier, I think that would work really well. Um, and then Madeline asks, what challenges do you face with your current working from home situation, which okay. I like a lot. And I have a really specific answer for that. And it's that my internet connection is absolute garbage. <laughs> Um, <laughs> if there's anything that a company could do to help me with that, I would be really excited. Google Fiber is listening. Very good. Uh, and then lastly, we have one um, from Leo. Uh, what aspects of working from home make you feel safe? Which I think is a, mm. a, that's an interesting question as well. Yeah, I like the way these are phrased. Um, and again, it's about for open ended questions. We're getting a lot of open ended questions. So I think we've, we've done a good job, Carrie, of, of installing the virtues of open ended questions. Uh, it's about the language that comes back. What words are, is your audience using? And then finding patterns within those so that not only you can address their concerns in this example, but you can message to them using the same exact words, mm -hmm. which is really important for clarity. It's a really good one. Um, so we did have um, someone, uh, Rebecca. <clears throat> had her own business objective Great. Uh, that she wanted to share that I think we could use as, uh, one more one more exercise. Um, and so she's interested in gathering uh, 
her objective would be to gather use cases um, for a mobile application, but this is a mobile application that's aimed towards people who are normally using desktop. Did I get that that summary right, Rebecca, of what you're asking? Excellent. Yeah. So <clears throat> the business objective is you're trying to figure out uh, how to get people interested in a mobile application that are normally uh, using this particular platform uh, on their desktop. I think we can just take a couple minutes to think about some questions that would <clears throat> get to the heart of that. What would convince desktop users to use a mobile version of the application? While they're writing, I'll, I'll throw out a spoiler alert. I'd probably want uh, a question about segmenting the audience. We haven't seen that in these examples, mm. but we we certainly want to segment the audience in terms of and 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 be prescriptive about it. Uh, which of these uh, you know, devices or platforms to use most? Uh, desk, you know, work desktop, laptop, phone, tablet, and make them choose one um, so that we can get some actionable data and then segment the answers based on that and see if there are any patterns between those that use mobile all the time versus those that use tablet or, or laptop all the time. I think that's a great opportunity for a, a segmented question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And going back to the, uh, what would make you feel safe to come back to the office? A good audience segmenting question is um, maybe even whether or not you had young children at home, because that might impact how someone feels about coming back to the office versus someone who's not having to worry about what they're gonna do with their kids all day. That's a great point. And once you do that, all this great data that you've already collected now has, you've got twice as much of it. Or great. Yeah, it's got greater value. Yeah, because you can segment the answers and compare them. Oh, you know, everyone said X, Y, and Z, but you know, when we looked at people who had small children at home, they were really focused on this. And it's just, it's just a more rich data experience. So any answers to that mobile versus desktop experience that have come in? Uh, not yet. We'll give that 20 more seconds. In the meantime, <clears throat> we do have two other uh, comments, questions. Uh, we have uh, Paige actually had a, another uh, audience segmenting idea for the COVID question, which is, do you have any family members at high risk that are immune compromised or elderly? I think it's a really good one. That's a good one. Um, and then we have uh, a question from someone who says, is it okay to use segmenting as far as identifying departments and such when performing internal surveys? And I'd say, absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, if that's gonna be, if you have an internal survey and you wanna be able to compare how answers differ between different departments, absolutely. That's a great, great way to segment an audience. And that reminds me of something that hasn't come up in this session, but has in others. You can segment any way if you're going to use it, if you're going to use that data, you know, some people, I, I think they, we've always done it this way, thinking makes people, forces them to imagine, well, I have to first find out uh, geography uh, or age uh, or gender. And if that's important to the end product, then sure. But if it's not, there's no need to ask that. There's no need to ask a, a superfluous uh, targeting demographic question. If you're yeah. Not and demographics is actually an area where people who maybe don't know any better, they're just trying to inject some, some new stuff onto your survey that you're creating. Um, demographics is one of those areas where people really get caught up in asking things that aren't actually going to be usable because they feel like they should ask it or they think it would be neat to know. 
Um, you know, but if there's no point in knowing how someone from the West Coast would answer versus someone's from the East Coast, then then don't don't ask what state they're in. Yeah. Um, you know, just because you think it's neat. Or uh, sometimes um, I think a lot of people have an inclination to ask about uh, income brackets. Mm -hmm. um, but there's actually not a lot of use cases where the income bracket information is genuinely useful. I'm not saying it's never useful, but it's certainly not as useful as often as people actually ask it. Um, so that's another one where people get really swept up. It's a really great point. Um, <clears throat> all right, so let's uh, let's wrap up the the questions for um, trying to figure out how to get desktop people to use a mobile app. Uh, do we have any questions for that objective? And if we don't, I'm, uh, we can we can always take additional questions. In fact, I know Carrie, you you like to uh, talk about if people do have survey questions that they are uh, working on uh, in real life. Mm -hmm. That's true. Uh, let's see here. From Claire, we have uh, any wording suggestions for having users self-identify based on their experience with the product. So maybe you have uh, users who are beginner, intermediate, or advanced. Um, but maybe some of those labels make users self-conscious, like maybe they don't, uh, you know, feeling like that question is a test of their knowledge skill. And that's a really valid question. And I think that's absolutely right. That's a really good instinct. Even, you know, people do feel like surveys, even though they're being asked for their opinion, a lot of people do feel like they're being tested on their knowledge in school. People want to get the right answer. It's part of why uh, if you ask them open-ended questions later, they mirror your multiple choice language because on some level, whether it's conscious or subconscious, they're trying to be correct in their answer. Um, <clears throat> uh, so yeah, having people self-identify based on their experience with the product, I think if you can use um, time labels rather than beginner, intermediate, advanced. So I've been using the product for less than a year, more than a year, uh, you know, uh, more than three years, you know, three plus years, something like that, trying to deal with time, which feels more objective than personal experience, I think would be a good way uh, to address that. Let's see here. And then we have from Paige is an exit survey on the web page for the web version, the desktop app. Uh, what hesitations would you have about completing the task you just completed on a mobile application next time? I think that's a really good one. Hmm. Did you catch that, Dan? I did. I'm thinking about it. What hesitations would you have about completing it on a mobile app? Yeah, I worry about the response. I worry I'd get none. Just because it's easy to say. Well, maybe it's a binary question. Maybe yeah. it's not asking about hesitations because it's a pop-up on a task they just completed. Um, would you consider completing the task you just completed on a mobile application? I like that. And then you can evaluate the tasks and see, oh goodness, you know, we have 10 tasks and eight of them. People said, yeah, no problem. But these two tasks, uh, people said, no, not at all. Yeah, That's I think true. Yeah, so maybe it's a two question survey. Maybe the first question is, would you complete the task on a mobile app next time? And the next question is, what task did you just complete? Yeah, that's another great two question survey also of, you know, uh, customer satisfaction. Would you refer this product? Would you use this product? Would you refer it to a friend? For those that say yes, great. For those that say no, why not? Mm -hmm. Get in a list of those answers. That's a good one. Uh, Joshua says, uh, you mentioned a company designing a website without any survey information. If you're developing a website that has numerous features, at what stage do you seek out feedback so you know what to focus on? Before building, when you have a sample product, or after production? Before building. Every time, we'll say before wow. building. Um, you know, when you have a sample product, um, that's a good time to get sort of like a smaller scale, like maybe you're, you're having maybe some actual user testing or you're having um, you know three to five customers actually look at the sample product and you can see them uh, making their way through it for the first time and giving you commentary 
but before you even get to that point, before you've, you know, when you're still defining what the requirements are for the website, that's the best time to put that survey out in the field. Uh, Madeline has a question. She says her job sending out a survey for a new feature that's not released yet. How can she bring up these topics to the rest of the team? She's a QA analyst on the dev team and they do have an in-house UX team. Um, that's a great question. I, I think that it would be fair to say, to just go to the team and say, hey, listen, you know what? I just attended this workshop on survey creation and I wouldn't mind taking a look at the survey and seeing if I have anything um, to add as the, you know, and they're gonna let you look at the survey, um, you know, as long as you don't word it as, can I review your survey to make sure it's not terrible? <laughs> On a scale of one to 10, how bad is that survey? How bad is that survey? Yeah. <laughs> but I think if you just say, hey, do you mind if I take a look and see if I have anything to add? And then you can use that as the doorway to, to give some feedback. And you can give them the context of, hey, I just attended a workshop and here are some ideas I, ha I have. Um, I, think, I think people will be receptive to it. And I think UX people, <clears throat> I, might, I might be biased because I am one, but I think UX people tend to be open to new ideas that are gonna make their process better. Um, I think that's true. Yeah. But I think just saying, I might have something to add, letting that open the door. I think that's how I would approach that. But that might, yeah, go ahead. Let's see here. We got a couple more questions okay. uh, from Leo. If you're in a situation where many decisions have been made without directly surveying users, what would you recommend? Is there still value to be found in surveying for a product that is under construction? Would it just be surveying for a new feature? Um, you know, I think it would be fair to still put a survey out if it's not too late to stop things that are uh, in motion. Um, or if there's some angst over things that are in motion. I think that if you could put together a survey as if there wasn't something that's already in motion in the company, because the users you send the survey to, they don't know that you're working on it. Um, I think you could still, the, still create and send out a survey as if this product hasn't already been started to be being built because you're still going to get valuable data back um, and you may be able to stop if there's something that's just like really off path and off the rails you still have an opportunity to stop it or at least attempt to at least be able to say hey we have information that says uh you know these three features are actually not important so maybe we need to focus our energy on these other features i don't think it's too late and even when something is live let's say they built it and they live and they put it up you can still put a survey out to see uh, how people feel about what you put out there live. Like you can still make changes to it. Um, so I don't think there's any, there, there's definitely points in the process where it's more ideal, mm -hmm. but there's never a point where I think it's, it's too late. I'd agree with that. Um, and then Claire asks, uh, any thoughts on the, the MPS question for user satisfaction on internal tools? Yeah, the, yeah. the net promoter score stuff. Um, unfortunately, there's not a different way of interpreting, but I will say this is something that people ask about a lot and we have to deal with um, net promoter score data a lot. In fact, one of Dan's favorite activities is to go through somebody's um, list of net promoter score feedback, the little write-in part of it and organize it into categories. I'm not kidding. It's like his favorite it's hobby. A fun activity. <laughs> it is. Um, but the thing about net promoter scores, for those who aren't familiar, it's kind of like this user satisfaction um, question. It's on, uh, it's, but it's basically numerically based. It's asking you to rank things. Um, and there's no other way to ask those questions. And I think this is one instance, this is a thought I had recently, where it is okay to ask a ranking question scale of one to 10. I don't think it's useful for making decisions about a product or making something, but MPS ultimately, their end result, their objective is to get a number. That's all they care about. Um, so <clears throat> I don't think the MPS score is terribly val valuable in terms of making decisions based on those question answers, but in terms of getting 
a number that you can just say, oh yeah, we're at a seven and we want to be at an eight. That is useful for someone. Hmm. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't use it to drive product team decisions. Yeah. For a longitudinal study, it, it, it can be useful. The idea of, oh, you know, look at our, our, we chart our growth. We went from a six to a seven to an eight. Uh, that, that, that can be helpful, but uh, agreed. It, it doesn't really do anything to the product. Okay. Yeah. Claire says that in their case, that the, the MPS question is how likely are you to recommend this tool to a colleague? And I think, yeah, just question. Uh, we just, we prefer it as a yes or no. Would yeah. you refer this to a friend? Yes or no? Easier to answer. And again, takes the guesswork out of, well, my seven isn't necessarily your seven. Yeah. But just for in terms of tracking, you know, if you're, if the, the goal is just to track an NPS score, I don't know if there's a different way of interpreting, you know, you're just really locked in with that, that net promoter score method. Awesome. So I would like to ask one uh, final question. Uh, does everyone feel like you would be able to leave here and make an effective survey? We got a yes, absolutely. A yes. Oh, I'm so glad to see yeses. At, at the risk of swaying this survey, I would be really upset if somebody said no, they wouldn't feel confident about making a survey. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <clears throat> well, to that end, as you as you go off and make your own surveys, which you're now empowered to do, we'd love to hear from you to hear how that uh, progression is going. Uh, share with us any any uh, results you get in terms of whether it's higher response rate or how your questions influence product, uh, or, or certainly if you continue to have questions, we we love to hear from you. Yeah, and it, and we really mean that. <clears throat> in the past, we've had people that attend workshops that um, continue to email me every time they put a survey out in the field so they can tell me how it went. But I really I cherish those emails, and I do really love seeing how uh, people's surveys go. Uh, and what they're asking and uh, reasons they've put surveys out in the field. Because sometimes people get really creative about uh, why they've even sent a survey out to begin with. Uh, Madeline asked if you can follow or add us on LinkedIn. Yes, we are both on LinkedIn. Uh, I don't know if our, I think if you search uh, by our email addresses, we should pop up for you. Absolutely. And Dan's like, he's a LinkedIn super user. I like LinkedIn. <laughs> That and going through net promoter score data. <laughs> yeah, those are Dan's hobbies. <laughs> Very boring existence. <laughs> yeah, he's more interesting than he sounds. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. All right. Well, then, why, why don't we leave it there? All right. Thanks, everyone. That's our show. Thank you very much.